Would you take your Bible and go with me to Romans chapter 7? Romans chapter 7. There is something that has um, happened for me in the last year since we were here that um, I, don't know how to, I, I don't know how to say it other than just to say it this way, that, um, that I really believe is going to change something not... I can't speak on behalf of you. I can only say this for myself that I really think that this year the missions conference is going to be completely different for me. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be uh, what they call today um, uh, very transparent about uh, what I mean by that and what's happened for me. In, in every ministry, uh, if, if God's called you into the ministry and God gives you an opportunity to do, I hope you understand what, what I mean by that, not... Not the average person today that says, well, I know that I should be a part of this, but they don't. I'm talking about the Christian who God begins to work in their life, and they sell out to it, and they really begin to serve God. Does that make sense? When we get into that point, sometimes it can become a rut. It's not always a bad rut because what we're doing is right. But sometimes you can do right the wrong way. And, uh, and something that God has impressed my heart with is the fact that it can become very easy to do ministry. It can become easy to go in and to preach the gospel because the gospel is true. Amen. It could become very easy for us to say, Thus saith the Lord. Now apply it, and here's what the world does, and here's what Christians do. Now let's, let's do right. And then you leave, and you go, well, I did. But there's no long-lasting effect, not just in the, in the people that you preach to, but even in your own self. And so I just began to pray this year at different times, just because of different circumstances, and I said, Lord, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to just preach because I can, and I don't want to just preach what I know because I know it. I want something to be fresh. And I'm going to be, again, very transparent with you and tell you this. Sometimes that means falling flat on your face. It really does. That can be very embarrassing, not physically, but emotionally and spiritually because... You can prepare, you can read a passage of Scripture, and you can say, this is what I'm supposed to share with people. And when you try to share it, it doesn't always come out right. It doesn't always come out the way that we think is right. But for some strange reason, God always has a way of taking that, what we think is not quite right, and making it exactly what He wanted it. And uh, that doesn't always feel good. It doesn't always, because you don't always get a pat on the shoulder. You don't always get a smile back. You don't always hear an amen. You don't always get somebody that says, that was exactly what I needed at that moment. But Sometimes it's months down the road, and sometimes it's a year down the road when somebody says, do you remember when you did or you said, or that one little thought that you gave, that's what made the difference for me in my life. That's what makes everything right. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to be honest with you tonight. I'm going to walk you through some of the thoughts that God's impressed my heart with out of this passage of Scripture. And I want to share a message with you tonight just very simply entitled this. We're still dealing with self. We're still dealing with self. And it's always going to be a struggle because we're still dealing with us. And us is always going to have something that's going to have to be dealt with. Are you with me in Romans chapter 7? Amen. Look with me in verse 1. I want to just point out just a few of the thoughts in this, and then we're going to go to the end of the chapter. The Bible says in verse 1, Know ye not. Now, this is a good question, so pay, pay attention to this. Know ye not. In other words, this is something you should know. This is a good thing. 
And then he says, brethren. So we're talking to the child of God. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? Now there's another, there's a question mark that's right there. So I, I want I just I want to just preface what you could be reading in verse one down through verse six by, by telling you this. There is a definite liberty from a bondage that we have in our life. And, and I want to I want to say this. There is something that we are careful to preach, careful to say, because we are careful not to associate with a wrong crowd. Here's what I mean by that. There is a vast, I mean major difference between biblical law and biblical grace. Are you with me so far? You understand what I'm saying? So what I'm going to tell you, I'm telling you based on the fact that we, we truly believe that, that there's a, a massive difference between those that were prior to the cross of Christ and you and I in what gift. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about a gift that God has given you. Salvation is salvation. We know that. But we have an advantage that God has given you and I that they did not have. He says this. Okay, disciples, listen. You've seen me. You've walked with me. You've seen the miracles. You've experienced all these things. But listen to me. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. I'm not saying that we're better than somebody. I am saying this. We certainly are a step above in a blessing that because we did not have the opportunity to walk with Christ, we don't have to apply those things to us and say we're under a bondage because that's the day we live in. We live in a time when God says you are so blessed because you've not seen me that you do not have to live under that. We don't even grasp how awesome that is. We're looking at some things in our life much like they did, and we go, yeah, but it's this, and here's the problem, and all of this, failing to realize the gratitude that we ought to have and bestow upon God himself simply because he said, we're the ones that are greatly blessed. We don't even think about it. He asks a question right there. Do you not know this? He's talking to them. Listen, Paul says, know ye not? Look at it again with me. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? Listen to this. You can truly say in your life today, that right there does not apply to the church age I am a part of. Why? Because if you go back one chapter prior to this, there is a verse in verse 14. The Bible says this, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Do you know that what Christ promised to you was that you can have such a relationship in me that you can honestly say, I am not controlled by that law. I walk in a grace. It cannot have dominion over me. Let me say this to you. I know we make joke about it, but there are Christians today who literally, listen, young people say this, not just you. Adults say this. Pastors say this. They fall. They get involved in something that they shouldn't, and all of a sudden the statement they make is this. The devil made me do that. Listen, they go a, 
they go, I'll say, a sinful step even lower to make this statement. Well, that's just how flesh is. Do you know what? That has no dominion over you. We are, we are getting ready. This may be where I'm falling on my face, but I'm going to tell you this. We're getting ready for not just a missions conference like every year. We're getting ready for a moving of the Holy Spirit to so overtake Faith Baptist Church that it is literally going to scare Christians to death. And it should. And if it doesn't, there's a reason it doesn't. If it doesn't, if you don't recognize the moving of God this year, there's got to be a reason why you're not seeing it. Because I'm going to tell you what, he's already started. There's testimonies of people. Do you, do you, and we're not going to blame the devil for all the bad stuff that happens to us. But I'm going to tell you what, the devil is mad enough that he's going to want some bad stuff to happen. Christian, listen to me. He has no dominion over us. Amen. We're not going to let that happen. Now, I want to make a statement before we go on, and I'm going to tell you this. We were talking about this in the office. Today, we face a generation that has given in and fallen prey to this power of positive thinking type churchy stuff. In other words, what they believe is name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, and it's yours. All you got to do is just speak it into existence. And that, I mean, you know, that, that's as bad as saying, you know, I am rich, 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 you know, and you're not. <laughs> and we go, well, I must not have enough faith. That must be why I'm not getting rich. No, it's because you spend so much time talking about it, you never went to your job. <laughs> go to work. Guess what? Your bills will get paid. <laughs> Right? But we can also take that power of the spoken word and use it in the right manner in the life of the child of God today. There is a power of positive thinking. There is a power in singing those songs. There is a power. Do you know that whenever, whenever one song was mentioned tonight and another song began to play, do you know that as that piano played, we all started singing the song that was being played because we know the power in that song. We also know the power in the other song too. There was not one that we had to choose from and go, well, which one's more powerful? Because we know the God of both. You know, as as that song could have been played, and we could have sung the lyrics to the other song. It wouldn't have changed the power of God in it. And yet today... There's a generation that believes that if you, only, you can only speak certain things and that's the only way God's going to hear you. Well, I want you to know, God hears you when you cry too. But there's a power in, in speaking to God positively. The Bible tells us here, if you go down into verse 7, from verse 7 all the way down into verse 14, that... There's a list of how the law and the believer are, are, are intertwined in, in what we need to know and how we work in all of this. The Bible says in verse 8, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. That's a powerful thing. You know that I've had a relationship with God before the foundations of the world. He knew me already. God's already got my life in his hand. He knows who I am. But then I have to make a choice. Am I going to try to live under an old law that states that I myself have to do all of these things to make sure that I think that I'm good enough or measure up enough in order to make it there? Or could I say this? It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing the Holy Ghost. 
So I choose then to understand that I don't live under that, but I live under this blessedness of the grace of God. We go on down through that chapter in verse 15. Some strife begins. You can read from verse 15 on down into verse uh, uh, 17 and 18 and all of that. I want you to, if you will, go to verse 18. I want to read from verse 18 to verse 25. Notice this with me, if you will. Here's what Paul says. For I know that in me that is in my flesh. Do you see it? Do you see the, the, the parentheses there? Do you, do you see what he's saying? We're not talking about the Spirit of God. Any, I'm talking about the flesh. He says this, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. I know that. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I think a lot of us are in that same boat today. We go, I know that my flesh is wrong. I know I'm struggling with my flesh. I know i got to deal with it. I know i got to die to self. I just can't figure out how. I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to a lot of people in a lot of churches today by telling you this. I think there is a generation of Christians today that want to do right. They just don't know how. Because we've believed something else. We've believed a lie that not only the world, but sometimes even the church has allowed us to believe. And we're falling backwards rather than going forward in the blessed grace of God. Listen to this. He says in verse 20, Now, if I do that I would not, it's no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So understand that. Verse 21, he said, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Hey, let me tell you something. That's still a good fact. You start doing good for God, know that evil is going to show up right there with it. It says in verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. You know, a lot of times we start looking at people and we go, well, they're not very happy Christians. They're not very happy in the Lord. But the Apostle Paul said, it's not about the outward appearance. It's about what's going on inside. Now, let me tell you this. When something good starts happening on the inside, it's going to start showing up on the outside eventually. I, I feel sorry for the Christian that walks around telling everybody that they're a child of God like they're miserable. Yes, I'm a Christian. It's good to be in God's house. God is so good. God. <laughs> you want to go? You want to go back out to the car and start again? Come back in when you're ready. You know, because it does. It doesn't work that way. It starts on the inside. It starts coming out. It's like. Squishing is it, man. It pussy on the inside, eventually it comes out. I figured to you teenagers that amen that. <laughs> Verse 22. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And he says this, O oh, wretched man that I am, exclamation point, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Do you know that if words are important and placement of words are important, would you also take notice that you should not and cannot reverse in that last verse we just read and it mean the same thing? Listen to this again in verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the death of this body? Doesn't say that. It says from the body of this death, which means that this flesh is a problem. It is a body full of death. Do you know what we're still warring with today? The flesh. Do you know what's going to hinder revival? It's not the fact that we did pray. It's not, gonna, it's not the fact that we want to see God do some great things. It's the fact that something in us tells us it can't happen. And tonight I'm going to tell you what it is. It's your mind. I 
I'm going to prove a point. All right? We're going to do this as an exercise. So just follow along, and I'll tell you what you've done. All right? I want you to repeat after me. Yes, I can. We're going to say it again. You ready? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Here's what you just did. You went from this. Yes, I can. To. You know why? Because what you're saying is positive. You know where that comes from? It comes from what we just planted in your mind. Do you know that what dwells in you, in the spirit of God's people today, is the power of God within us? That's the promise of God. It's a command. You get saved, you have the power of God that dwells in you. He gave you that as a, as a gift. So if that's in me, then what is it that convinces my flesh, no, I can't? It's the mind. So tonight I want to tell you this. We're still dealing with the flesh. But I want to tell you how to overcome it tonight. Tonight I want to tell you this. Very, four very simple principles. They're going to go very quickly tonight. But they simply mean this. At the end of the message, you need to understand this. They simply mean this. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. If the Apostle Paul in that verse, in verse 24 and 25 actually, if he had put a period there and stopped there, essentially what would have happened was you and I would still have a dilemma that we're dealing with. But instead, he takes us a step farther. Because if you'll look with me in the next chapter in verse 8, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after what? In other words, if we'll pay attention to what Paul just said, he just said this, you can get over that. You can have dominion over it, not it over you. As a matter of fact, there's no way that that can, can, can control you if your mind and what's inside of you is focused on Jesus Christ. It has no authority in your life. And if we will decide to say positive thinking... I'm here for a purpose of serving the Lord Jesus Christ and quit saying, I don't know if I can serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We can accomplish the revival that God has for us. We can see missions explode. We can see the church grow. We can continue to win lost people to Jesus Christ. Not because the world convinced us, but because what we allowed to happen was God get in this mind. You know what he said to us? Let this mind be in you. Let it in there. Get out the junk and let my mind be inside of you. How am I going to do that? I want to show you four thoughts tonight on how to do that. Principle number one is this. Recognize we got a problem. And it's going to be so simple. Listen to this. Recognize we got a problem. Well, what's the problem? The flesh. I'll tell you this. Here's a true statement. The flesh is unchangeable. Do you know that your flesh is always going to be that? Do you know that what you're going to do, you're never going to get to the point where you say, I have completely transformed my flesh. It is completely righteous. I'll never sin again. That's never going to happen. Why? Because it's flesh. Because we still deal with this. And I've got to learn, how can I overcome this? If it has no dominion over me, how can I then have dominion over it? Number one. Number one principle, recognize you got a problem. What's the problem? I got flesh. It is what it is. I want to see revival come. I want to do what God wants me to do. Paul said that. The things I know I should do, I don't. And the things I know that I shouldn't do, that's what I end up doing. And I don't understand why. I'll tell you why, Paul. Because what you've let in your mind is something opposite of what God's word says. Let me make a statement to you. A disregard for God's word will always create confusion. A disregard 
For the very word of God will always create confusion in your mind. When we don't live what God has commanded us to live, it won't be long until our mind starts telling us we don't have to. Well, I want to tell you this. Somebody's going to say this. I have to go to work. But rarely do they ever say, I have to go to church. Come on, think this through with me. Principle number one, we got a flesh problem. You know what Jesus said to the disciples? He said this to them. All right, guys, listen, we're on the move. Here's where we're going and all of this. Oh, however, I must, needs, go through Samaria. You know what he just told them? He said, I want you to put this in your mind. This is not a suggestion. I have to go. Why? Because there's somebody there that needs me. Listen, young people, don't let any church, don't let any denomination, don't let any TV program, any song you ever hear, not even songs that we even write, don't let anything ever convince you that there is something greater than having to live for Christ. You have to. You say, well, I don't want to be made do anything. Welcome to reality. But we have to serve the Lord. That's why we're here. Principle number one, we got a problem. I recognize that. Principle number two, you got to remember your position. Do you, know, do you know that in Christ, do you know that Christ already looks at you as a victor? It's not a progressive thing. In other words, you don't, you know, you don't get saved and live a little while and then all of a sudden God says, you know what, you're starting to get close to victory in your life. When you became a child of God, what God sees in you is something that has been washed whiter than snow, and he says, you are overcomers. You are that. We've got to, number one, recognize we have a problem. How am I going to overcome this flesh, this mindset that I can't? I'll tell you what, number one, Understand that we have a flesh problem. I, okay, I get that. Now, what's the next thing? Put it in your mind that what I know about me is what Christ said about me, and that is, I am a victor. I'm going to tell you something. I, I know that we're, I'm robbing this phrase. This is the, if, I, if, if I'm telling it right, this is a biblical way of looking at the power of positive thinking. You want to be positive about something? Quit letting the world tell you that you can't know for sure you're saved. But instead, tell yourself. Put it in. You say, I know Christ got in my life and all this kind of stuff, but I'm still struggling with understanding. You know what that is? It's the mind. There's got to be a convincing of our mind that who we are in Christ is victors in Christ. And today, Christians are still battling with all of that. We were in Cedar City, Utah, not a couple of weeks ago. And, 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 and while we were there, a uh, pastor came to me, and we were talking about a certain situation in a family. And he said, the, he said, the husband is all on board. The kids are all on board. And he said, the wife got saved first years ago. She's the one that invited the family to come to church. And now she's the one who's convinced she's not sure she's really saved. And he said, I don't know what to tell her. I said, well, I don't know that I would know everything to tell her, but I can tell you this. Her struggle is not with Jesus Christ because she's not the one making sure she's saved. Jesus Christ saved your soul. He did the work. Her problem is up here. Her problem, is, and I asked him this. I said, who's she listening to? He said, I asked her the same thing. And he had a list of things that this lady gave him of radio broadcasts, of books that she's reading, uh, of people, friends that she's talking to that are convincing her that you can't really know for sure. I'm going to tell you something. The Word of God says you can know for sure. Period. How am I going to get to the point where I understand that my flesh is not just flesh, but it is a problem. How am I going to overcome that? You've got to get it in your head. It's not about that flesh. It's about Jesus Christ. That's more important for me to understand. Listen to this. We've got to resist a pressure. 
Principle number three. How am I going to overcome me? You've got to resist the pressure. What do you mean by that? Well, listen to this. The flesh can't be changed, but it can be controlled. It can't be changed, but it can be controlled. C.H. Spurgeon preached a great message one time on, on the power of the tongue. And in his message, he talked about how that there were things that comes out of our mouth that we need to get away from and we need to lay those things at the altar. He said that he was standing in his testimony, he was standing in the front giving an invitation and there was a dear lady in the church that approached him and she said very privately and quietly, she said, Dr. Spurgeon, she said, I, uh, I have a problem with my tongue and I would like to lay it at the altar. He said, well, it's about 18 feet long. Put as much of it on there as you can. Come back and do it again. <laughs> you know what? We got a problem. And we understand. Listen to me. It's not about the fact of saying, well, I just couldn't keep from doing it. Yes, you can. And you can keep the world from convincing your mind that you can't have a walk with Jesus Christ. Your flesh can't be changed, but it can be controlled. The Apostle Paul made sure that we understood that. It's not about the fact of saying, well, whatever happens, happens. Do you know that there is a belief today, and, and, and I've heard this in different churches, where they say, all you got to do is let go and let God. No, you don't. You're not going to find let go and let God in the Word of God. You will find that you have to strive for righteousness. You don't let go and whatever happens there is a control you have to take care of in your life and say, you know what? It's not about whatever happens, happens. I will determine and decide. I will strive for righteousness. How bad do you want it? I want to see revival in this country today. The question is, how bad do God's people want it? It's not that God can't send it. It's how bad do we want it? I think not only do we have to resist the pressure, but listen, lastly, I want to tell you this. You can only do this by relying on God's power. What do you mean, preacher? I mean this. We got to put us aside. We got to say it's not about what I want. It's not about the way we've always done it. It's not about, well, that's just who we are. No. A lot of it is, that's, a lot, that's who we've allowed ourselves to become. I know this about Faith Baptist Church, and I think I could speak on behalf of my entire family in telling you this. We've grown very close to this church. This church has become family to our family. And the last thing I want to see happen is it to become like a lot of the other churches that we're in all year long. What's happening is that God's people have allowed this worldly thinking to get in and convince them that, no, you can't. Well, you know what the spirit of Faith Baptist Church has been for us? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We're about to approach... This week of the missions conference, it's coming so soon. I don't want that missions, I don't even want to call it that. I don't want what God is doing already in our hearts to be squelched by the thinking that that's the only time it can happen. We've got to allow in our mind, in, in, in our hearts, but in our mind especially, to be convinced, so convinced in the power of God that if we're going to continue on doing what God wants us to do in this church, it's only going to happen because we decide nothing else has dominion over this. So I'm asking you to do this. Would you make a conscious decision to say, yes, I can? Don't say, well, what if? No, say, yes, I can. Well, 
but, but what if this, no, 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 stop, listen. You don't know any of the what ifs. What you do know is the decision you make. We do know what God wants for us. Now the question is, what are you going to believe? You're going to believe God? You're going to believe Him in your mind. Not just trust Him for salvation, but are you going to trust Him up here? Are you going to say, I don't always see it, but I know God will not fail? Or are we going to say, well, whatever happens, happens. Que sera, sera. I believe that Faith Baptist Church, the family that we are, I believe that there's so much God in this place that if we joined together and we stood so firm on the foundation of the Word of God together, that the entire state of Utah would know that's the place God shows up. Pastor Bickle and I talk on the phone often and We've also shared stories about how that different preachers that we both know will say that when they've come to this place to preach, they always say, they all say the same thing. Wow, it was so easy to preach there. So much liberty to preach there and all of that. You know why that is? It's not just because of your smiling faces. It's because I believe this is the place that God shows up. My challenge to you, and, and uh, we're, not even, we're not even in the week of missions conference yet, but today I was reading through that passage again, wrote down a few extra notes, and I just said, Lord, I, I'm not trying to preach a sermon to him tonight. It's not, it's not about that. I want to tell you from my heart to you, from my head to yours, there's got to be such unity this year. Because this year is going to be so awesome. We'll only be able to say, that was God that did that. And I want to see that happen. I think that you do too. Would you let me pray with you tonight?